function of labor and capital. So labor is denoted as as a. So anytime you see a function like this, what I'm using the mouse to point, anytime you see a function like this, this basically means that this output Q solely depends on the labor and the capital. That is why we are saying it's a function of labor and what? Capital. So we are looking at the maximum amount of output that can be produced with these two inputs in place. Okay, now, So these are the production functions that we have. Now, it is also important for us to understand something we call um, PS in production, okay? But before even we understand the PS in production, we are supposed to understand two main concepts, which we term as first. We have the fixed input and the variable input. Now, we would want to understand this for a reason. Okay, so when we say fixed input, what do we mean by fixed input? And when we say variable input, what do we mean by variable input? When we say fixed input, it's basically that input that does not change with the level of output. Okay, so no matter what we do, that input will never change. Okay, and that input that change with the level of output is termed as the variable input. Okay, so the distinction between fixed and variable input is important because of two time periods of production in micro accounts. Okay, you know, last, I think you guys are in training. So when you guys were in 200 first semester, you guys did basically everything we are doing in managerial accounts. Okay, so we also studied that in microeconomics, we have two time period, which is the short run and the long run. And this, is necessary for we trying to distinguish between fixed and what variable inputs. Okay, because of the time periods. Okay, so when we take um, the short run, we are saying that the short run is a period of production in which at least one input is fixed. Okay, so I'll give a better example moving forward. And the long run, okay, is a period of production in which all inputs are variable, okay? And that is basically why we are supposed to understand the time period or the two concepts called the fixed and the variable. This means, you know, when we say short run and long run, we are not really, really talking in terms of time period like five years, three years, one year, six months, one week or two weeks. That is, that is not what this short run means. Okay, this short run basically means that if um at least and make one fixed period as a short run period whether this month so we are just trying to say that we are looking at the period okay where the firm would be able to obtain at least one input being fixed okay likewise the long run when we say the long run the long run also doesn't look like 10 years five years in terms of time okay we are looking at the firm being able to vary all eight factors of production within the shorter possible time. Okay, so the, we can see that the firm is in a long run, even within two weeks, if the firm is able to vary all its output, all in, its input, okay, within two weeks, we would say that that firm is in what? The long run. By a case where the firm, at least one input is in short run period. Okay. And this is really necessary for a bit of comparison between um, our input and the, out, um, the output in the short run and both in the long run as well. 
Okay, so we are going to learn some productivity measures. Okay, now before we even learn them, there are three functions that we are going to use in this lecture. Okay. And the first one is called the Cobb-Douglas production function. The second one is called Lientiev. And the last one is called the linear function. Okay. It is necessary to understand the reason. Okay. But after this, we are going to focus mainly on the Cobb-Douglas. Okay. So we'll be doing the other functions, but we won't focus mainly on them, but rather we'll focus on what the Cobb Douglas function. Okay, so if we take the Cobb Douglas function, that is what we are basically going to use most often. Now, we are going to measure productivity in terms of total product, marginal product of labor, and average product of labor. Okay, so looking at the Cobb Douglas function here, we are saying that total product. Is the slice national? Okay, so looking at the Cobb Douglas function here, we could see that. So basically, when we say the Cobb Douglas function, that's how it is. Let me do some indication here. Okay, so this is the Cobb Douglas function. The Cobb Douglas function is basically saying Q is equals to um, K alpha L beta. That's usually how the Cobb Douglas function looks like. Okay, so we would, of course, take this function, okay. but first let's just get this as what, the total output we are producing using the Cobb Douglas function. Okay, so here we are saying that K, which is capital is fixed, okay, at 16 units. So we are going to replace this capital with 16 in the short run. So we are saying we are in the short run because one input is fixed here. Okay, so if we produce a function like this, like this, all that we are trying to say is we are making one input fixed, and here is the capital being fixed and the labor um, being variable. So we are saying capital is 16 units. And if you know your labor amount or unit of labor, you'd be able to calculate for the output for what that production. Okay, so that's basically what we are trying to put across here. Now, we can also take this function in another form. Okay, so with this, we have labor to be 100. So you put 100 in the equation. Remember, we had this is the four here. And if we put this hundred of units of labor into the equation, we are going to get um, 10. So if I multiply the four by the 10, we are going to get the 40 units. Now, one would ask, what is our total product? Total product is basically the maximum amount of outputs that can be produced with K units of capital and L units of labor, okay? And this point, we are using just the Cobb Douglas function to explain the total product, okay? And the next product is the marginal product of labor, okay? So when we say marginal product of labor, all that we are trying to say is the additional benefits we get from employing one extra unit of labor. Okay, so the calculation for marginal product of labor is basically the change in Q over the change in L. So let's say if I have a graph like this, okay, if I have a graph like this, 
and we are being asked to. So usually the labor will be here and the capital will be here. But because we are looking at just the labor, which being variable, we are going to strike the labor with respect to what the output we are producing. So if we are being asked, okay, so let's assume um, we have something like this. Okay, so we have something like this. So if we are being asked to calculate for the marginal product of labor, if we have a change of this, basically all that we are trying to say is for you to get a change is just the new. Okay, so the change is going to be our new, which is Q1 minus what? Q0 all over L1 minus L0. This should give us the change at the end of the day. Okay, this will give us the change at the end of the day. So we are just looking at um, the additional benefits we are getting from employing one extra unit of labor. Okay, and remember we are in the short run so we can vary labor. Okay, assuming labor wasn't the one we are varying. So now we are assuming labor to be fixed and capital to be variable, then we are going to see that the marginal product of capital, okay, marginal product of capital, it will be equal to change in Q all over what? Change in K. Okay, so this is basically how simple it is if we ask you to find for the marginal product of capital. Okay, that's basically how it is. Very simple, okay. Now, we could also talk about something called the average product of labor. Okay, so with the average product of labor, again, in microeconomics, we studied that when we are taking averages, just the quantity over what? The labor. So question three. Yeah, question three. Okay. Averages. Okay, so the average marginal product of capital, the product of capital, and average product of product of labor it's put per worker. Okay, I told you guys earlier that with this course, we are going to focus more on what the Cobb Douglas function. So the examiner could give you something quantitative like this. Okay, so remember the Q is equals to what? Our Q here is equals to K raised to the power 0 0.5, L 0 0.5. Okay, now if I want to find average product of labor, it's going to be average product of labor is going to be um, Q all over L. So if I come here, I know my Q already. So the Q is what? K 0 0.5, L 0 0.5. If I divide through by this, I'm going to divide through by what? L. Okay. Now remember L and K has been given and they are saying L and K is what? 16. So if I put 16 0 0.5 here, then I put 16 0 0.5. Here and divide the whole of this by what? So this they are saying will give us what we can also sometimes calculate for average product of the one that is variable here, but rather it's the one that is fixed. Then we can vary what our capital. So we could find for average product of what capital as well. And the formula is not going to change. Okay, so average product of capital, which is K, is going to basically be Q over what? K. Remember, this will still be the same as K 0 0.5, L 0 0.5, all over K. So during this computation, you would get the same answer at the end of the day. Okay, so that's how simple the average product of labor is also okay so now we are going to learn something very simple you guys learned this in um 
managerial economic ma microeconomics okay which is like a time period okay and production okay this is what I, I was actually talking of okay but before i go through this do you have any question for me up to this point i don't want to leave anyone behind So, so far as we are not many, I think I can mention names. Okay. So, Abna, do you have a question? Abigail. Okay. So, if in the absence of any question, we can just also focus on this time period scene production okay so we could see the diagram projected here okay so remember with this diagram we are in the short run okay all that we are doing is in the short run so we are just about to move to the long run but before that let's try and discuss this diagram in the short run uses only two inputs Okay, therefore, capital is the fixed input and labor is the variable input here. If capital is the fixed input, then labor is going to be the one that is going to be changing if we want to change our output. So now, because capital is fixed and labor is what is going to change, does it basically mean that we can continuously um, we can continue to apply more and more variable input onto our fixed input to get more output indefinitely. Well, it's really not necessary, okay? Because initially with a fixed input, if we start applying our variable products will increase and increase at, a decrease, at an increasing rate, Okay, and then it will get to a point where it will be increasing, but at a decreasing rate. Okay, and that is this side. Remember, this is our total product line. That's why we have the Q here. Okay, so if we continuously increase our labor, we would see that our total product will be increasing. Okay, then it will get to a point where it will start increasing, though, but it will be what? increasing at a decreasing rate. Okay, so you could see this, just you were increasing at, then when we go to this side, it started increasing, but at a decreasing rate. This is because, okay, basically when the fixed input gets crowded and then it gets to a point where output will not change, that means total product will be, it, be at its maximum and then output will start falling, which would mean that total product will start also hot, falling. Okay, so as you can see from the diagram here, you can see that it has been increasing at a decreasing rate. So it gets to its maximum, okay? Then from the maximum, it starts what falling. And this is why we say this exhibits diminishing marginal returns. Okay, so as we continuously increase one variable, fixed, um, in variable input on fixed input, the total product to attain maximum, then from there it will just start falling. Okay. Now, so that is for the total product. We can also talk about the marginal product, which is the line here. Okay, the marginal product, which is the line here. Marginal product is basically the additional um, benefits we are getting from employing one extra unit of labor. Mm -hmm. Abnaya, why is the line still breaking? Sir, please, it's okay now. Oh, okay. So Thanks. let's talk about the marginal products. Thank you. 
Now, looking at this, you can see that marginal product is, sorry. Looking at the diagram here, you can see that marginal product is obviously the change in what? Total product as a result of you changing your labor unit. Okay, so remember we said that marginal product is just the change of Q all over change in L. Okay, so as a result of rechanging our labor onto the face input, you could see that you would have the marginal product being something like this. Okay, so you would find that the marginal product will be increasing as your total product is increasing at an increasing rate. And where you product, we will see the average product falling. That is this side. You see that it is falling. Okay. This basically means that there is a, re a relationship between what the marginal product and the average product. Now, this gives or brings about the three main returns that we have in production. Okay. And the first one is what? The marginal increasing marginal returns. And the second one is the diminishing marginal returns and the negative marginal returns. Now, if we say increasing marginal returns, all that we are trying to say is, um, it is a range of inputs. It is a range of inputs of input usage over which our NP starts increasing. Okay, and when we say diminishing marginal returns, we are saying that it's a range of input at which our input starts decreasing okay and the negative marginal returns basically means is the range of input usage where our mp also starts getting negative or we start getting negative in our mp okay so that's basically how the returns just get into the production system. Okay, so if you really get this diagram, then you would understand the returns we have in the production system. Okay, ask ourselves how much are we supposed to pay the labors that we've been employing in order to? get the maximum out. Guys, I was logged out again. I don't know what is wrong. So please, where did, where did I get to where you noticed you couldn't hear me? Please, where did I get to? Is it this side? Decreasing marginality. Okay, so... So the returns in... So when we say, let me take from the increasing marginal returns. So when we say increasing marginal returns, we are saying that is the range of input usage where our MP starts increasing. Okay. 
Then the diminishing, which is the decreasing marginal return, is the range of input usage where our MP starts decreasing or declining. Then the last one, which is the um, negative marginal return, is just the range of input usage where our MP is negative. Okay, so under exams condition, you would be asked to just explain these three things. Okay, so you just have to learn how to understand or just understand the terms from the layman's perspective. Since I wasn't with you guys. So with this, all that we are trying to say is, please, if you can't hear me, just tell me, okay, because I've been receiving multiple messages that my internet is not stable. So if you can't hear me, just alert me. Okay, so in this lecture, we just want to understand the right amount of inputs we need to get, okay, in order to get the maximum output. So, so far as we are in the short run, what are we supposed to do? How do we get the labor on board? Because the, that is the variable input here, and that's the only thing we can vary. With the capital, we are saying that it is fixed in the short run, so we can't vary that one. So we want to know how much labor we need to employ in order to get the maximum out of that labor, okay, or the maximum benefit out of that labor. Okay, so since we said we can't increase output indefinitely by increasing variable input, in the short run, we should, or we would want to compare the benefit that we are getting from the labor with the cost that we are incurring as a result of employing that labor. Okay, so remember the benefit that we will get from the labor is going to be in unit terms, which is basically the marginal product of labor. This is what in unit terms and the cost that we are going to incur from that labor, from employing that labor would be in CD term or value term. And you know, we can't just add these two in order to get what the benefit, the total benefits out of that labor. Okay, so we need to do something to this side in order to what, know the actual benefits we are getting. So we need to place value on that. And for us to be able to place value on the benefits we are getting from the labor, all that we need to do is to multiply the price, okay, times the additional benefits we are getting from the labor. And this, when we do this, this is term as the value of marginal product of what labor. So now we convert this additional benefit, which is in unit terms, into what a CD value as a result of multiplying it with what the price. Okay. And we are saying that for us to be or for us to get the best out of that, our value of marginal product of labor should be equal to what the wage we are paying that labor. Okay, so if we are paying you high amount of money, we are expecting um, a very high output as at the end of the day. Okay, so a, a case where the amount we are paying you is higher than your contribution, then it means you are not being helpful to the organization or the firm. Okay, so that is for the labor. Now let's assume in the short run, we decide to make labor fixed and capital variable we are going to get into the same situation. Remember, the marginal product of capital will be in unit term. Now, for us to be able to quantify this, we need to multiply the marginal product of capital by the price, okay? In order to compare it to the rate at which we are. Okay, so this area could be rate or rent. Okay, so you can just, if, if we are getting the value of marginal product of capital is equal to the rent, then we say we are getting the best out of what that kind of capital we are employing. Okay, now we are going to introduce another concept, which is also known as isoquant. Okay, now before we introduce this isoquant, we should know that we are now moving from the short run to 
the long run. Okay. Now, when we say isoquant, all that we are trying to say is that isoquant is the combination of input, which is basically our labor and our capital that yield the producer the same level of what output. Okay. So we sort um, of, or we tried saying that in the short run, we are going to make one input fixed and all variable. But here in the long run, we are going to make all the variables what, all, all the input variables. Okay, so in the long run, we said all inputs are variable. That is both labor and capital are going to be changing as we want to change our output. Okay, so the different combination of input that yields the producer the same level of output as what we actually term as isoquant. So isoquant is basically two words being joined. Okay, so the first word is iso. Iso basically means same. And the quant is like quantity that we've shortened. So iso quant quantity, okay. So same quantity that will yield the producer the same what output at the end of the day. Okay, so if you are producing, what will happen is that you are going to be able to combine, let's say, 15 units of capital and 15 units of labor, that will probably give you, let's say, 100 boxes of water. So let's assume we are producing water. So we can decide to bring on an assumption base. Okay, so we can, and we assume that this is going to give us, and equally decide to vary one of them. Okay, that doesn't mean we are making the other fix. So we can now decide to produce 20 units of labor and bring just 10 units of capital. And as a result of isoquant or the theory of isoquant, all that we are saying is that even if we try varying this, it should give us the same level of what output at the end of the day. Okay, so now let me try and give you a typical example of what an isoquant is. Okay, so if I should draw this diagram, so here you could see that we have something like this. This is how a typical isoquant looks like. Okay, this is how a typical isoquant looks like. Of course, isoquants that are above another isoquant will yield higher output. But let's say if you are here, remember here is capital and here is labor. Let's say if you are here, this will be your capital and this will be your labor. If you also move here, so assuming you try doing this, we are saying that this A and B should use, yield the same level of what, output. You can also be here, you can be here, or you can be here. It should also yield the same level of output, or here, or here. This should also yield the same level of what, output. Now, the isoquant is negatively or downward slope as a result of what, um, diminishing marginal returns. Okay, so looking at this, you could see that we are giving more of what capital to get, um, we are giving out more capital to get more of what labor. Okay, so as we are just doing this, it means we are increasing our labor, but we are reducing what our capital because the line is just moving from here to here. Okay, so that's basically how a typical isoquant looks like. So now we are going to talk about another um, another um, concept in isoquant of the isoquant. Remember, I've described why the isoquant looks downward sloping. Okay, and remember, I told you you prefer to use both capital and labor. Remember, we are using the Cobb Douglas, and with the Cobb Douglas, we are saying that. You prefer to use, um, let me show you the Cobb Douglas again. The Cobb Douglas function is just saying that we have Q alpha, then L beta. 
you see this one looks like they are multiplying meaning you can't use one without the other so all that you can you can do here is to use a proportion of this and a proportion of this okay and because you want to use um, both capital and labor in your production okay you must sacrifice more of one to get less of the other okay and here we are sacrificing more of capital to get less uh, more of what labor now we are doing you would in production you would do this on some basic assumptions okay so a case where the price you are paying on a labor is so high you wouldn't want to produce on a labor intensive base but rather you would want to do more of capital intensive okay and a case where let's say your everything is variable okay and with that you would okay so when labor is very very high you would want to use more labor perspective now so i was talking about the slope of what the isoquant and the slope of the isoquant is basically i want to clear this Okay, so the slope of the, okay, we just termed that slope as marginal rate of technical substitution. Okay, so with this marginal rate of technical substitution, all that we are saying is, is just we trying to give one to get less of the other. So if I come here, my MRST, MRTS, you see, we are giving more of K to get, looking at this, you see, we have MP all about MPK, the quant. Okay, so marginal product about, of labor over marginal product of capital. That is the slope of what the ISO quant. Let's move further before. So that's the slope, okay? That's the slope of the ISO quant. Now, I remember I told you guys that we are going to learn some um, basic functions. And I told you we have three functions in this production. Okay, so we have the first one to be the linear function. So we would have, if we are using a linear function, we are expecting to get a linear isoquant. Okay, so with a linear function, we are saying that With a linear function, we are saying that the goods are perfect substitute, meaning we can decide to use only labor or we can decide to use only capital without being affected. So you see, that is why we have that plus there. So if I do Q equals to AK plus BL, you know, with this, I can decide not to use labor at all, but still production will go on. And I can also decide not to use capital at all, but production will still go on. But look at the Cobdor glass, which is K alpha L beta. With this one, if you decide not to use one, it means the production will be zero. If you like make labor zero here, zero times this will be zero. So there will be no production. Okay, so with Cobdor glass later, you that they are not perfectly substitutable, okay? But for the linear, we are saying that they are perfect substitute analysis on which one is costing us and which one is, I decide not to produce labor at all or use without considering the labor. Or we can also do the, the opposite, okay? Now, if you like, see, if I do, AK where 
L is zero, I'm going to get the whole of this zero. So production would okay because we would be able to produce what AK um, units of that production. Now, we are saying that remember this A here and the B here, they are just constants, okay? So they are just variables representing something. So if let's say usually this constant A and the B should give a, should amount to one, okay? If they are amounting to one, Hello, sir. Let's see. Sir, please, your line is breaking. percent of capital, depending on the, the, the cost we are getting, labor. So let's say if capital is too much, we would want to produce more. Please, you okay now? Sir, please, can you explain it? Is it okay now? Yeah, I'm asking, is it okay now? Yes, please. Okay, so I was actually explaining the linear isocorpse. Breaking it means you are using a linear function. I use the staff. Okay, that's it. But this, I don't think it would go again. It should be fine. Hi, right, please, is it okay now? Yes, please. All right. So I was trying to explain the linear function. Okay. So I said that with the linear function, it's unlike the Cobb Douglas. Okay. Cobb Douglas, you can't decide to produce one without producing the other. This is Cobb Douglas function. If you decide not to produce labor, it means there will be no production. If also, if you also decide not to use capital in your production, there will be no production because if here is zero, everything here will be zero. But with the linear function, if you use a linear function in your production, no matter what you do, there will be a production, okay? So if you decide not to even use labor in your production, we will still have what? Capital being the end of our production, okay? And I said that the A and the B here, they are just constant. Okay, so we have A plus B should sum up to one. Okay, so we can decide to produce maybe 100% capital. We can also decide to produce um, 0 0.7 capital, meaning we are producing 0 0.3 labor. We can decide to produce 0 0.4 labor, meaning we are producing 0 0.6 capital. Okay, so this is how we can vary this in production. Now, the slope of the linear isoquant is just this, is just B over A. And how do we get this B over A? Okay, so let's take the production function. So the B over A comes as a result of we trying to differentiate something. Okay, so the function says we have QAK plus BL. Okay, so I can decide to take 
remember we have two variables here. So we are going to take a partial derivative of this. So if I take partial derivative of this with respect to K, okay? If I take partial derivative of this with respect to K, what do we get? We are going to get just A, right? Remember there is no A here. There is no K here, so here will be zero. So we'll get just A. Now, if I also decide to take partial derivative of L, we are going to get what? B, okay, B. And remember we said that the slope of the isoquant is what? MPL all over what? MPK. So with this in mind, we can say that the slope here, remember we have the L to be this one. The slope will be what? B over what? The A. So that's how we had this slope. Okay, so in exams, you can be asked to calculate for the slope, assuming you are using what? The linear production function. Now, how do we illustrate this linear production function on a graph? Okay, how do we illustrate this linear production function on a graph? Okay, so assuming I have a graph like this, let's assume we have a graph like this. The linear production function, remember here is K and here is L. Okay, so the linear production function usually looks like this. Pardon me for my lines, okay. Where we know this to be output one, output two, and output three. Okay, so this basically looks like an increasing output. Okay, so as we continuously try bring in another production line, another production line, our output would what increase. That's basically what it's here. Okay, in exams, they could give you a scenario where one will be increasing and one will be decreasing. You just have to, of course, the statement will make it clear for you and the exams condition, okay? So that is how we represent what the linear production um, or linear isoquants, okay, on a line or a graph. Now, the next thing we would want to talk about is the Leontief, okay? It's also another production function. So assuming we are using the Leontief in our production, what will be the function? Now, Leontief is, so this is what I just drew. This is the isoquant, linear isoquant graph, okay? So, this graph is the isoquant, and we are saying that on this graph, it will give us the same level of what output. So that's basically what if I decide to produce here, it should give me the same level of output trying to produce here. Okay, so that is it. So with the LUNTF, the LUNTF is basically saying that capital and labor are perfect complements. When we say perfect complement, basically what we are trying to put across is they are used together. Okay, you can't use one without using the other. Okay, so they are perfect complement. So the only way you can just maneuver your way out of this equation is to use a fixed proportion of each other. Okay, so we would have a production function to be mean. Okay. BK, comma, so let's just see. Oh. Okay, so this is how the uh, Leontief production function looks like. Okay, so this is minimum, like mean. Okay, so all that we are saying is with this, um, you can't just say you are using one without the other because there is no plus in this. Okay, so it means you have to use a fixed proportion of each other. So you can use 10% of this and 70. So basically this looks like the cup dog glass. Okay, so with this, the only problem is we are not, it's not like it's multiplying. Also, it's not like we are adding. So this one has no MTS of K and L. So we don't have a slope for this. Okay, we don't have a slope for 
the Leontief production function. So all that we are trying to say is use a fixed proportion of the input in order to produce what your output. Now, how do we show this on a graph? So if I should draw this, the Leontief basically looks like something like this. You see something like this. Okay. I don't think I drew this well. Okay, so let me draw it well. So this is how the Leontief looks like. Okay, so we can draw a graph like this, also showing what increasing what output. But note with the Leontief, all the time production happens here. Production happens here. Production happens here. Okay, so if I trace this one to this and this one to that, we'll get a proportion of each one that we are producing in the production. Okay, so that is how the Leontief also looks like. Remember, with the Leontief, we don't have any slope for it. So you can't calculate for the slope of what a Leontief. But for Cobb Douglas and the linear, we can calculate for what the slope for them. All right, so now let's move to um the cup douglas remember i told you for the purpose of this course we are going to focus mostly on the cup douglas okay so that's the graph that i drew not long ago that is for the leontief isoquant okay so cup douglas with the cup douglas we are saying they are not perfectly what substitute why are we saying they are not perfectly substitute they are not perfectly substituted because looking at the Cobb Douglas function here. Okay, looking at the Cobb Douglas function here, where we have Q equals to K alpha L beta. Looking at this function, there is no way you can substitute one for the other. So they are what? They are not perfect what? Substitutes. So we can't substitute one for the other. If we decide not to produce any of this, production will be zero. Okay, so let's say where L is equals to zero. This production function will be zero because K alpha, now we are going to have what? Zero beta. And anytime we multiply zero by something, we get zero. So production will be what? Zero. That is why we are saying they are not what? Perfect, perfect substitutes. Okay. So that's it. Now remember, the alpha and the beta you saw there. Sorry for the little net. So the alpha and the beta you saw here. You know, this is the share of capital in the output. And the B here is also the share of labor in the output. Okay, so assuming I have K and L equals to 16. And we are saying alpha and beta are 0 0.5, 0 0.5 each. Basically, we are saying that this 0 0.5 will give us the share of labor in the output. And the 0 0.5 on the beta will also give us what, the share of capital in what the output. So if I want to get this, I can say Q is equals to K, which is now 16, 0 0.5, then L, which is also now 16, 0 0.5. So this 0 0.5 just tells us the share of the labor and the capital in the output. So this will give us four times four, which is the same as what, 16. Okay, so that's basically what we are trying to say anytime we talk about what, the Cobb Douglas function. Now, there is one thing you would want to also understand about the Cobb Douglas function, which is how do we graph this Cobb Douglas function? Okay, so the Cobb Douglas function just looks like the perfect isoquant I drew initially. Okay, so this looks like a, an increasing output. Remember, we established from the beginning that isoquants on top or above other isoquants yield 
higher output. Okay, so and I, this isoquant will give us a higher output than this. This will also give us a higher output than this. But on the same line, it is going to give us the same output. The same line will give us the same output. But if it is above, it is going to give us what? A higher output. Okay, a higher output. Now, looking at this graph, you could see that this looks like a diminishing returns or diminishing marginal returns. And this graph, the slope, we call it diminishing marginal rate of technical substitution. You know, remember here is K and here is L. For us to get more of L, we need to sacrifice more of K, okay? So as we are sacrificing more of K, we are getting more of L. That is why we are calling this a diminishing marginal rate of technical substitution. Okay, and now for um, Cobb Douglas, the slope, which is the marginal rate of technical substitution of we sacrificing K to get more of L is the MPL all over MPK. When you were doing uh, microeconomics, you guys dealt with all these things. Okay, you dealt with all these things. So we can prove this. Okay, we can prove this, especially when we introduce our budget constraint. Okay, we would be able to prove this at the end of the day. Okay, so that is for the production function for Cobb Douglas. Okay, so, so everything here has been already been discussed. So we spoke about the diminishing marginal rate of technical substitution. We also said the Cobb Douglas is not perfectly substitutable or they are not perfect substitutes. So I remember I gave this Cobb Douglas function where I told you if we should make one zero, we are not going, we will get production to be what? Also zero. Now, the rate, which is the marginal rate of technical substitution is what? The MPL over what? The MPK. And this is how we draw this Cobb Douglas on a graph. Okay, and I remember I drew this one too on the graph for you. Okay, so now we are going to talk about another simple, um, another simple, concept. But before that, I wanted to help you prove um, the Cobb Douglas function. Okay, so remember, let's try and prove the Cobb Douglas function here. Okay, so let's do this here. All right, so with this Cobb Douglas function, I just want to prove how we got this marginal um, product of labor and marginal product of capital. Okay. So let's see. Remember we said that with this, we are trying to give out more capital to get less of labor, okay? So if we want to get the capital, therefore we need to reduce, if we are giving out capital, we are reducing what? Our output. Let's assume we've not touched our labor yet. So we are going to have, um, let's say, negative change of Y, which is our output, it's going to be the change of what? Capital times the marginal product of what? Capital. Okay, so if we really, really want to give out more capital to get more for labor, all that we are trying to say is, you giving out more of capital, you are going to reduce what your output, okay? And with this, we are going to get the change in output should be the same as the capital. Remember this change is what we are giving out. Okay, so we are going to get a change of the capital times what? Marginal product of what? The capital. Okay, now because we are giving more of capital, we are expecting to get what? More of labor. So the change is going to be changing Y equals to changing L 
times the marginal product of what? L. Remember, this is not negative because this is not what we are giving out. This is negative because we are giving out more capital to get what? Less, uh, more of labor. Remember the graph, which looks like this, meaning we are giving out what? More of capital to get less of this. Okay, so for us to get the intuition behind this, we can decide to combine these two functions. I would say negative change in y is equals to negative a uh, positive change in y. Remember, we are giving out more of capital to get more of labor. Okay, so if we do this, remember the capital function, which is k change in k times what the marginal product of k. So I can do change in k times the marginal product of k equals to um, changing L times the marginal product of what? L. Okay, remember we are giving out one to get more of the other. So that is basically what I did initially here. And now this time we are just trying to combine the two. Okay, so if I want to combine the two, then the new function would look basically like this. Okay basically like this. Now we want the formula to show something like this at the end of the day, okay? So if we really want the formula to show something like this at the end of the day, let me clean the graph here. Okay. Okay, so if we really want to let the final answer look like this, then we can do some small change of subject. Okay, so we can decide to divide through by changing change of R. So this will just go. So we are going to get something like um, changing K times MPK all over changing L, okay, equals to MPL. Now, remember we've done the one, one bit of it. We have to do the other bit, which is just also going to be what? Changing what? We are going to divide through by what? MPK. Okay, we are dividing all that by MPK. So if we do this, we are going to get what? Changing K over what? Changing L equals to MPL all over MPK. And this is what we call the marginal rate of technical substitution, where we give out more K to get more of what L. So that's how we had this function here. Okay, that's how we have we had this function here. Okay, so that is basically the slope of what the isoquant that we initially showed. Okay, that's how we have it. Okay, so we can now move to the, the new concept I wanted to talk of, which is the ISO cost. Okay. The ISO cost. Remember, in business, our main objective is to maximize profit, okay? So if we really want to maximize profit, then all that we need to do is to find our way out to reduce what? The cost that we incur in the organization, okay? So therefore, we would do our best, okay, to minimize the cost that we incur, okay, as a result of employing our labor and the capital. Okay, and in production, the cost function is giving us um, this W times L is the cost of labor plus R times K is also known as the cost of capital. Okay, so these two, these are the total cost that we would incur as a result of employing labor and work capital. Now, the concept of ISO cost is basically the maximum combination of input that produces or that produce a given level of output at the same cost. Okay, so we can employ some specific 
amount of labor and some specific amount of capital at a certain cost, which will yield us the same level of output. And that is the whole idea or basically what we are trying to what, do here. Okay, so if we really want to do that, remember here we are giving out capital to get more of labor. So we are going to make K the subject out of this equation. And if we try making K the subject out of this equation, we are going to see something like this. Okay, so if we try to rearrange this, now let's do this manually for you to appreciate how they had it. Okay, so see, we are going to have something like WL plus RK equals to C. Okay. So if I want to make K the subject, basically I can move the whole of this here. So I'm going to get RK equals to C minus what? WL. Now I want K, I don't want RK. So I can divide through by what? R and divide the whole of this also by R. If I take this, K will be equal to what? C over R minus WL over R. Okay, now, we can also get something like one over R. So what is here? One over R times C minus W over R times L. Okay. For the purpose of just separating this is to get a slope. And the slope is what we have here. So the slope of the ISO cost, okay, is the negative W over R, okay. The slope of the ISO course is the negative W over R. And remember, all that we are doing is we want to know the maximum amount of labor and capital we need to employ to what? Uh, get the best output out from them. So for us to not incur any further losses, we are saying that the slope of the ISO cost, okay, the slope of the ISO cost should be e equal to, so the ISO cost. Okay, so ISO cost is also the same as ISO, which is same cost. Okay, should be equal to what? The slope of the ISO quant. For us to get the right quantity of labor and capital so that we won't make any losses or incur any further cost, then we have to ensure that our slope of the ISO cost is equal to the slope of what the iso quant okay and remember we said that the slope of the iso quant is what mpl over what? mpk and we said the slope of what the iso cost is what negative w over r so if a case where our mpl is equals to what uh, negative w over r we are saying that it is going to help us be in equilibrium where we would get the maximum profit out of employing both labor and what the capital. That is the whole idea about the ISO cost and what the ISO quant. Now, let's try and put whatever we've done mathematically on a graph. Okay, remember putting the slope of the ISO cost and the ISO quant in mind. Okay, so if I want to do this, let's see how we can plot this on a graph. Okay, so this is how we can plot this on a graph. Okay, remember our final answer for the ISO cost, we had something like this. We had something like K, okay, equals to one over, or let's say C over R minus W over R L. Okay, so remember if this was a line of equation, which is MX plus C, would have said this is the intercept and this is the slope. So looking at this, we could see that this gives us the intercept, okay? And this side gives us what? the slope. So if I want to plot this on a graph, it is just basically going to be 
something like this. Okay, so this is our initial isocost line where we would have, remember this is the slope, the slope, the intercept is that y value where um, let, we assume x to be zero. Okay, so it does not really depend on the reaction of the labor. Okay, so where the labor is zero, we are saying that k will be equals to this c over all, the r. So we are going to name the c naught over r. The naught there is just basically trying to tell us that we are starting from some point or an initial point. That is the c naught. Then here would be, remember this is k, and k is measured using the rent. And this is L. L is measured using what? The wage. So here is going to be C naught divided by the W, which is the wage we are paying. Okay. And we are getting this out of what the intercept here. Okay. If we should introduce another isocost line, remember isocost above um, another isocost will give us a higher cost. Okay. And we are expecting our output to also want to increase with it. Okay, if we really want to be efficient. So looking at this, we can say C1 all over what? C1 over W. Okay, so that's basically what is here. Okay, so this is our first isocost line and this is our second isocost line. Remember, this is an increasing isocost line where our C1 is just greater than our C0, which is what they've written here. Okay, they are just saying C naught is less than what? C1, which is just the same as what I've written here. Okay, so that is all about the graphing. Now, when you look at the down here, you see that there is um, some different diagram here. Now, let's try and understand this diagram. All that we are trying to say out of this diagram is very simple. So you could see the giving an inscription where they are saying um, the wage has increased. Okay, so let's assume we, we try increasing our wage. And remember, if we try increasing our, our wage, labor is going to be more costly. And if labor becomes more costly, we will just shift from you being more labor intensive towards being more capital intensive. So you can see that at the same capital, okay, so capital is not really, really costly, but you could see that the labor is what? Very high. And anytime labor is very high, the ISO cost line will turn a clockwise form. Okay, so when we say clockwise, so let me just draw this diagram here. Okay, so you could see this, something like this here, okay. Remember, this is what our C over R. And this would have initially been our C naught over W. And now this is C1 over W. Okay, so anytime wage increases, okay, anytime our wage increases, we would tend not to employ more laborers, okay, because we would run at a loss because will pay a lot of wage on their head. Now we would want to do more capital intensity, hence reducing what this labor consumption. Okay, that is why this is turning a clockwise um, shape here, where we would have now C1 over what W, then C the C naught over what W. So this occurs only when what our wage is increasing. Okay, assuming our wage was decreasing you would see that this would show another line moving. So this time, because wage is decreasing, we'd want to do more um, labor intensive than being capital intensive. So this graph wouldn't have looked the same as this. Okay, so that's the whole idea about this graph. Okay. Okay, so now let's see the cost minimization um, point. Where do we minimize cost in this production? So we said, as we, I, I stated earlier, 
I said that we would minimize costs where what are marginal product of labor per marginal product of capital is equals to the wage and the per capita we are paying, okay? So that is basically what is here. And I've already I've, expressed, I've actually expressed this not long ago, okay? So looking at this, we are saying that we would be able to spend less dollars on employing both capital and labor if we are in this position, okay? So this position is basically, we saying that, is basically we saying that our marginal product of labor and marginal product of capital. Remember, this is what the slope of the isoquant is equals to what our wage over the rate. Okay, so we would be able to minimize cost where our marginal product of labor is equal our ISO cost is equal to what our isoquant line. Okay. And when this occurs, we are saying that that organization is what in cost minimization stage. Okay, so we can try and also plot this on a graph. Okay, we can try and plot this on a graph. So how do we plot this on a graph? This is just the graph we are talking of here. Okay, this is the graph we are talking of. So if I can here and I try to plot the graph. Let's see the graph, how it will look like. So what is this? So the graph would look like something like this. Okay, remember this line is what? Our ISO cost line. Okay, remember the Cobb Douglas. If we try to draw the ISO quant, we are going to have something like this. Okay, so the point where the ISO quant touches the ISO cost line here is what we say the MPL over MPK equals to W over R. So this is the point. Okay, that's the point of what cost minimization. So we could give you a table, then we would ask you to calculate for all these things manually. Okay, remember here is labor and here is capital. So we have the ISO cost line and the ISO quant line. When they intersect on a graph, then we would have what the point of cost minimization. So that's basically what I've just drawn here. And these are output for the ISO quant. This is the output, okay. So that is also not difficult to get. Now let's see, we're trying to incorporate um, a change in wage on the same graph, okay. So if we want to incorporate a change in wage on the same graph, which will which should give us basically an optimal input at the end of the day, we are supposed to, so this is what we are trying to say. This is the graph we want to explain, okay? So with this graph, all that we are trying to say is we are trying to incorporate both um, the change in wage on the initial graph, okay? So let's take this graph one by one and try and explain it one by one. Okay, so there's the graph. Okay, so the initial graph is this, where we have this red line. You can see the red line where we have C naught over W naught. That's the initial line. So if I come here, I could say, C naught over W naught, okay? So we are expecting capital to be C naught over what? R naught. Remember, this is our capital and this is our labor, okay? So we are saying that 
with this, assuming we try to um, introduce our isocost and the isoquant line at the same point. So let's say our K naught here, we are trying to plot this K naught with respect to, so we are introducing another isocost, isocost line. So we would say that this K naught is going to give us what C1 all over W1. So this will give us what K naught. Okay, so we are going to try and draw our isocost isoquant line. So if we want to draw our isoquant line, we are expecting to get something like this. Okay. Something like this. So let's assume this point touched. Okay. So you will notice that we are now having um, two graphs, a two point where the isocost is touching the isoquant, which is this first one. Okay, which is this first one. So we trace this one here to get the first labor. Okay. So we say labor not. Then we trace this one also here to get a second labor, which is labor one. Okay. So we are going to name this side A and we we'll name this side B. Okay, now looking at the initial point, we could also say that there was another line which says we have our C naught over W1. Now, this is the point we would want to try and explain where we have the C1 and the W1. All that we are trying to say is remember this is our output at the end of the day. And if we should trace this line also here, we are going to get our K1. Okay, this is what we would want to explain. The rest are just two points joining. So you could see that we have C1 here, W1, but we have C0 here, W1, meaning we had initial isocost line. And when we tried increasing our wage, okay, when we tried increasing our wage, we just saw a sharp clockwise movement of the isocost line just happening here. And this is what we were trying to understand that anytime we have an isocost line, okay, where it is showing a clockwise turn, it means one input is being changed, okay? And when we try changing one input, making that input more costlier, okay? Here, here we are having what, um, what's the name? We are having the labor to be more costly. Okay, so you can see that labor, when labor becomes more costly, we are just going to stop producing, using more labor, but rather we would want to produce more using what, more capital. Okay, that is what, Initially, if you can remember, we drew a graph like this where we saw something like this. Okay, so we drew a graph like this that we saw something like this. Okay, and I told you this is the C naught, W naught, and this was the C1, W1. Okay, so where the labor increased, we tried to be more capital intensive. So there was a clockwise turn to this side. Okay, because we are reducing the quantity of labor we are employing into the business, but rather we are increasing our capital in the production. Okay, so that is the whole, whole audio about this particular graph. Okay, so the main objective is to try and understand why this C1 has shifted to this side. Okay, so whenever wage increases, we are expecting the company or the organization to produce more using capital, okay? In order to get the optimal inputs at the end of the day, okay? So where capital two tries to increase, the company would want to produce more using what? The labor, okay? At the end of the day. So that is basically how this diagram is explained, okay? 
So that is the end of production. Okay, that is basically the end of production. So I would want to pause here. If you have any question that you would want to ask, because um, I plan on doing production, only production today, then we would do cost some other time. Okay, so if you have any question, you can just ask. Um, so the answer was um, the formula it was um, W L plus R K is equal to C. Please so let me write what you are saying. So that you won't change your mind. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you are saying that the I is equals. Okay, the formula is what? The W L plus R K is equal to C. Please, this is the cost function. This is not the I is equal function. Okay, okay. So what does the C stand for? The C, that's cost. Yes, please. Okay, okay. So the W L is the price of labor. And the RK is the price of capital. Okay, so it's wage times the unit of labor we are having, and R is the rent or the rate times the capital we are having. And when we add these two, we get the cost. Okay, thank you, sir. Come again. I said thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so thank you for your time. Okay. We thank shall you meet. Too. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.